You're watching the new Stack Makers, a podcast for people who develop, deploy, and manage at scale software. For more information and articles about at scale technologies, please visit thenewstack.io. Now enjoy the show. InfoBIP Shift conferences have successfully gathered the global developer community for more than a decade, offering them high quality programs as well as career advancing and networking opportunities in a unique atmosphere that sets apart these events from others in the tech industry. Hey all, I'm so excited today. I have Ivan Burzin and Ivan has been the one behind the Shift Conference for many years. I went last year. It's in Zadar, Croatia. And it really, to me, helped me meet a lot of people who I don't necessarily run into that often. These were really sophisticated people who are doing very complex front-end development work, I'd say a lot, but also back-end development work. And I've been has an interesting background. Ivan started a company called Code Anywhere, the cloud integrated development environment. And today we were just chatting a little bit just beforehand. And I said, you know, I want to talk about developers and, you know, from your point of view about the things that you look for, you know, developer productivity. And you stopped me and you said, you know, really what it's about is the humanity and the people themselves. And this makes a lot of sense to me. I'll tell you why in a minute, but I'd love to just get your perspective. Sure. I mean, when we're talking about the conference and what goes into organizing, I really believe it's more about like that human interaction, human experience. And that's where different conferences in this case can really um, shine because one thing, like when you look at a conference or whatever it is, you can say, oh, there's a stage, there's speakers, there's attendees, there's sponsors, right? Um, and these things can be there, but can, they can also be very, very dry because we've all been to conferences and the ones that you remember are the ones that made you feel something. And I specifically say feel something. It doesn't matter specifically what you feel. Um, and that it can be a lot of triggers, right? Like at, at the shift conference, we do things like, there's music that is constantly repeated, which we like. And the idea is that when you hear that song later on, like you think of the conference, like it's a remember, you remember that, right? Um, there's little things that happen at the event that encourage serendipitous introductions because you want to meet new people. But we usually fall back on the same people that we already know, right? But it's a better event if we've met new people. So we want to do that as well. I mean, at the last event, we also had like sports cars that you can drive, like literally you can drive a sports car. And I yeah. thought that was cool because a lot of people, it will be their first time that they'll do that. And even though it has yeah. nothing to do with the conference itself, they'll remember it. I mean, car people, if someone likes cars, right? And they're like, oh, I got to drive it there. And you do all these little things that don't seem relevant to the context of a developer conference, yet it actually does a lot to make people feel something about that conference. And I think that's what brings them back every time. So that's why I say it's more about the humanity, the, ex the human experience, rather than just like the technical aspect of the audience, which is highly technical that, that comes to these events. How does that relate to the work that people do as developers? So I think that those experience per se will not help them in their work. Um, that's where we have the more standard, as I say, dry part. I mean, they don't, the presentations don't have to be dry, but in the sense of like, we have to have speakers that have amazing content that are interesting to people that will help them learn and whatnot. And so that part helps them in their work. But the human part, before I feel like you're getting the human part will help them in the sense of the network that they can build around themselves and that can potentially help them with their work, but it won't necessarily help them with their job, essentially being a better software engineer. When you think about development these days, there's a lot of people talking about that experience that goes into development. And one thing you hear a lot about from people in DevOps circles, at least, is empathy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to like connect something that doesn't necessarily need to be connected. But I think of that experience that developers have and why it's so much more important. And like, you know, and there's 
some correlation. I think the conference is like, you know, you're competing more now with other conferences than ever before. And a lot of them are very big and, and, and capture, you know, thousands of peoples at their event. Uh, but you're doing it a little bit different to provide kind of more of a style that is more friendly and perhaps and maybe even putting yourselves in their shoes. And so I'd like to kind of just shift this conference, <laughs> no pun intended, uh, to that the topics that you address in these conferences and what are you trying to do to put yourselves in the developer's feet, so to speak? Sure. I mean, there's two parts to that. And what you said is like uh, the talk of experience, um, specifically developer experience. And that just happens to be my title here at InfoBib. But I, I don't think it's fundamentally different. So here we're talking about creating a human experience that people will actually enjoy and yep. like. Uh, but also if we look at from a software developer perspective, actual developer experience, um, we can look at examples of companies that have done this really well. So you take a company like Vercel, for example, um, right. they have an amazing developer experience. When I say that, the experience that you as a developer, as a customer, interact with on every phase of the interaction with that company, their website, their documentation, their dashboard, everything's amazing. You enjoy using that. And because of that, I think that's why that company has such a high valuation, a high and such a successful company. And there's other companies doing that. So there's a new company called Resend, which is basically an API email uh, provider. And so API email providers have been around for ages. There's lots of them. And you wouldn't think that someone else can come onto the market. And so what their unique selling proposition is superior developer experience. And that's it. Um, and people are willing to pay a premium to use that because it has a better developer experience. Now, I'm talking about exter in the sense of an external developer as a customer using it, but it still reigns true that people want to be feel want to feel respected. And someone told me, like, told uh, I'm quoting someone. They said superior experience could be user experience or developer experience shows that you respect the person using it. Um, and I think that reigns pretty true for me on all aspects. So when you think about the spectrum of discussions related to the developer experience, what do you think about? So when I think about developer experience, um, there's basically two realms that are sort of in that. And one is external and one is internal. And so what I mean by that external is what I just mentioned, where the developer is essentially the customer and the experience that they're having that. And that is very similar to user experience in the sense of a consumer mobile app, right? So the consumer enjoys the experience and because that shops or uses your app, whatever it may be, right? Um, but there's also in the sense of developer experience internal inside of the company, um, which I think is driven by developer or the need to increase developer velocity um, on one hand for the entire organization. So the entire organization wants the velocity of the developer to be faster. So the amount of you know code or product that they actually deploy uh, but at the same time, the experience that developers have while using that has to be better or more enjoyable because in, in a sense, they will actually be able to produce more faster. Mm -hmm. So producing more, producing faster. And then on the other side of the coin is the external like experience that you get from whatever is being offered through a service like Vercel. Absolutely. And so they're all experiences, right? And they can be similar internal and external, but I think there's different drivers to each of them, right? On one hand, when you're the consumer, you're a person and you want to feel that what you're using is great or you enjoy using that, right? Um, it's similar internally, but there's a different driver, right? There's a there's an entity that is paying for everyone's salary, paying, it has deadlines and whatnot. And then there's different levers that are being uh, used there to, um, to decide on what goes into uh, developer experience. Sort of thing. Right. So, and on the external side, it's interesting because you're getting, you know, you're going using, for instance, a uh, service because you really like it or because it fits your, you know, your requirements. So I'm curious, like from the developer perspective, the types of discussions that you would expect to 
have about like the internal developer experience, like optimizing it. Like what are the what are the different topics that are interesting to you right now? Uh, the topics that are like super interesting to me personally is very much that developer velocity in the sense of what slows down the developers in their day-to-day -day job, right? And I actually uh, did some research myself and I found that developers waste about 50 to 70% of their productive time not coding. Um, and so what I mean by productive time is like when you remove um, vacation days, when you remove admin, admin work that they have to do, so meetings, whatever it may be, when you remove all that, and then you have that core time in the day that's left to essentially work, um, you have a lot of things that still get in the way, right? You have to wait for um, the spinning up of the environment, you have to wait for tests, you have to wait for builds, and these are large portions of time. Like average, the time wasted on setting up a development environment, I think is 2.7 hours a week. Um, for tests, it's over three hours a week. Uh, and for builds, it's almost four hours a week. And so we've tested this, we've done research internally and seen some other ones as well. And that's about 10 hours a week um, that's being removed, that's being taken away from the developer. And so that's something that what I think about um, and ways, in what ways can we solve that? Because no one actually wants to wait for these things, right? And so you you essentially, if you can solve these things in theory, the developer will be happier, the one that's working and the enterprise will, or the company or whatever will be happier as well, because you're not wasting time waiting for these things. So waiting for things is one thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like what are some particular things that you've had to wait for that frustrated you? So, I mean, it could be just waiting for, you know, if you're waiting for your builds, you just have to wait for them. There's nothing you can do. You're just waiting for right. when your, your laptop machine is like building it. You're waiting for that. Um, but there's also, it's not just waiting in some of those waiting is one, but also there's things like configuration drift in the sense that the, you and I are collaborating together. And now, you know, we have the famous, well, it works on my machine problem. Well, it doesn't work on mine. Right. And now I have to bash my head against the wall and figure out why it doesn't work. And so that's not just waiting. That's just also troubleshooting things that you actually shouldn't be troubleshooting because these, these issues are not going to happen in production, right? That's not, it's a non-issue. It will work. So why would I be wasting my time? Are you wasting your time just to get on the same page so we can work together? I think that's something also very annoying as well. Um, not only is it a waste of time, but it also agitates people. So discussions such as configuration drift are of interest. Uh, what other topics do you see in the agenda that reflect kind of some of your current interests? So in the agenda, if we're talking about shift, we try to... We have six stages at Shift, so we try to have multiple different themes on each of the stages, right? Um, but also, we do change the themes according to, you know, what is actually happening in the market and what people are interested in, right? So just an example, I'm taking a step back one second, is like, obviously, this year, we'll have an AI stage. Like, everyone wants to talk about that. That is all the rave, right? Um, which we didn't have last year. That wasn't there. Um, but what we did include two years ago, and we'll be here again, will be a cloud native stage. So everything like uh, in that sort of sphere, because it seems to be more and more interesting to people. And I like it as well. But there is also one stage that we call developer experience, which is a mix of both these internal and external um, themes and issues that I personally are very much, am very much interested in and would like to hear more. And so that's why we put those topics in. And I feel that it's something more interesting. I believe we messaged before this as well, that, you know, things like developer experience, and developer velocity are very much newer themes that have become I mean, they've always existed, existed, but a theme that people are actually paying attention to. So the AI stage, let's talk about AI just for a minute. Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it, if you look at uh, the space around LLMs, it had minimal research put into it over the years. Then ChatGPT emerged and it show that when something gets introduced to the web, anything can happen, right? And, you know, I, in my belief, it's less about ChatGPT's interface. It's less about ChatGPT's capability. It's more that now you had exposure to more people than ever before. 
and it just created that energy that pushed it forward. But people get into things and they don't know much about them. So what's your education focus here? What is it that you're going to try to do to help educate people? Absolutely. I think a lot of people are not educated in the space and don't know enough. And that's actually very natural because it is something that because of chat GPT to your point, that was sort of the inflection point, which it made it essentially cool or people wanted to do that. Um, and there's not, I mean, there's been research for years, but there has not been a way there's not been a structured way to sort of learn about there's not a lot of experts out there like you had to go and learn on your own as best you could but what we've seen is and we've seen this before when uh, when there's other sort of technological uh tectonic shifts like people organize around each other like all of a sudden you have discord groups and you have other right. Slack groups you have um you know hacker news obviously and media outlets like yourselves that will post these things someone made something right. or someone right and then you, you start learning and conversing with people. Obviously, there's a ton of meetups. I mean, people have been saying, and I'm not going to get into the discussion of geographic places, but essentially people are saying San Francisco is back. A lot of my Twitter is like SF is back, SF is back, right? And AI has been very much something that's been pushing that people are converging there to meet in person and talk about what's next in AI because they feel right. like AI is that next, you know, it's the next internet, basically. Right. It's the next internet. Is that how you view it? So I feel, um, I wouldn't use it as the internet. So I use that from a interest and financial standpoint. So I don't think it's going to, it's not a, it's not a replacement of the internet, but the way that the web specifically, um, changed the way companies were built, financed, um, created, um, and some of them disappeared as well. Like all that interest that was that grew around that i feel that that's that's happening with around ai as well now is that something that goes is that something instead of the internet no uh it's something that works with it but that interest around that and we have to also say and we're getting into different these themes now um because of the interest of the investment community so the vc community around ai that is even like it has added gasoline to the fire of AI because of everything else. So the entire market has sort of slowed down in tech generally. But if you're doing something in AI, it's like, you know, two years ago again. So everyone's interested. Funding rounds are happening. <clears throat> and obviously a lot of people are interested because, you know, um, financial incentive is important with things you do. So I feel that that's there as well. So that's also pushing things in AI even faster. What are the topics that you think relate to developers right now? You know, a, a lot of issues are still needing attention. I mean, you know, I was looking at uh, TLDR uh, this morning, and there's a story about, you know, how to reduce the size of a JavaScript bundle, right? You know, so these are so there's all these major there's all these things that people are just still trying to figure out. How are you trying to position AI for the developers who are just dealing with these kinds of issues all the time? So it, there's a lot of things you can there's a lot of ways you can look at AI and how to help. The way if we're talking about the conference and where we're trying to position ourselves um, regarding AI, it is to help educate people to become developers in the AI space in the sense of creating something utilizing what we now, now call AI. So that's what we're doing. There's a lot of things that you can do with AI that can help you, you know, help you in your work or whatnot and help things make things better. We have, we're not focusing that from theme perspective. It's more about like, how can you actually build a product, company, service, whatever, utilizing AI, or I can't say it's AI specific because everything in the sense that Every company is an internet company. As I said, every company will be an AI, AI company uh, going forward. So it's like, how can you build something utilizing AI? That's sort of how we look at setting up the themes of that stage. So are you looking at tools? Are you looking at issues? Are you looking at, you know, we've talked about education. 
Like, what is your, I mean, sure, absolutely. What, I mean, I, 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 let me just share something. Like one of the things that, you know, we're trying to shape our coverage, right. As you know, AI emerges. And for instance, one of the things, I mean, we deal with a lot of, you know, people who are looking at, they're not using AI right now. They are, uh, get is getting learning the very much the very basics of it but it's leading to interest in other topics such as data engineering and and real-time streaming and all those things that you need to get set up so you actually have the infrastructure ready no absolutely all of those things are needed and we're all going to figure it out once we start digging into it but to your point like what are we interested in it, it's not in the sense of tools from a practitioner point of view. Exactly. It's more from like an infrastructure point of view, like the tools, what you can do to make. So I'll give you an example uh, of an acquaintance of mine that's creating a new company, which is they're basically creating um, AI developers. So in the sense, not a co-pilot, of, of GitHub's in the sense that it works inside your ID, but basically when you check out, um, your code, to the GitHub repo, it will, uh, sorry, when you push the GitHub repo, it will check it out and do some work on it and then commit it, um, again. Right. And then it's like a teammate essentially with you. So it's not something, someone that's on your shoulder, it's someone you collaborate with. Right. And so how that product was created. So from, from one aspect, the, the point of someone like that talking would not be, you can use this to help your job better, although that is a valid topic, but it's more like how that person went about creating that entire AI agent call it. And that's really interesting to us because then you actually get to the things that you we were talking about is like, what are those layers needed? What do you need to know to be able to create something like that for yourself? Let's talk about some of the other topics too that you'll see you know on stage at InfoBip just so we cover them cloud native technologies. What are some of the others that really interest you right now? Is it cloud native? Is it other stuff? So cloud native is probably something that's very personal. I mean, I'm, I started as a front end developer or started as a web designer originally a long time ago. So everything in front end is always super interesting to me. I just like things that are visual. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's a lot easier to comprehend. And it, you know, if everything looks very nice and we've talked about experiences and that's probably why I also got into uh, conferences and experiences in that in general. Um, but because of things I'm looking to do further and looking at the problems that are, that I mentioned earlier with developer velocity and the history that I have with code anywhere, um, cloud native is definitely something that I personally have interest in. So then I look into those as well. So to your point, like to your question, AI is something that's very, I use it as much as I can in the day to stay on top of things and to try things out and to test it. So I have a lot of, you know, interest in that. So we look into that cloud native, very personal on how to solve problems. So I look into that as well. And then, you know, front end, there's also other themes, which are not my, I won't say not my cup of tea, but not my favorite. And then I'll let someone else from the team actually pick those out. Okay. Why, why do you, why are you so enamored with cloud native? Uh, because I feel that. And this goes back to Code Anywhere. So we could have started Code Anywhere officially in 2013, but we actually created the product in 2009. So our vision in 2009, and this is, mind you, github.com did not exist and web 2.0 did not exist. So you remember these days. Um, some people I talk to today don't know about these days. They're much younger than we are. Um, and so we started back then, and the idea was to remove the developed environment essentially off the local host, off the constraints of the local host and utilize the cloud to um, speed up uh, developer velocity. And so we never really succeeded that with that with Code Anywhere. We were quite early on that, but I feel that the stars have aligned in the universe now. Um, and then, and that problem still hasn't been solved. Um, and there are a lot of problems with that. And so that's why cloud native is the underlining Basically, the infrastructure that you use to do that um, aligns with that, and that's why I have interest there. Well, I could talk with you for quite a long time, Ivan, but I want to thank you for joining you know, me in this discussion. Um, I actually wanted to ask one last question. Okay, so I installed Python yesterday, right? Okay. And uh, 
um, I'm starting. I'm starting my own little project, right? Okay. And I'm looking for an IDE. Okay. Why? Why? Why would I start with uh, uh, Cloud Anywhere? Oh, with Code Anywhere. So Code Anywhere. I wouldn't say Code Anywhere specifically, and that's something that um, we can talk about next time more about yeah. solutions that I'm working on. Uh, but definitely, I think that a cloud development environment or cloud IDE would make sense for you to start off right away. So you can think, you know, GitHub has code spaces. There's obviously Replit um, and different. They have different um, pros and cons, and I know them very well. I can get into that. But I feel that the reason that you would start off because you basically need one button and it spins up and you start coding and you don't have to worry about anything else. You will not bash your head against the wall um, that it does not work on your machine. So code space is over VS Code. Uh, for some for some use cases, definitely, yeah. I mean, it is in the cloud. Microsoft owns that code. There's you know okay. security reasons why someone might not yeah. want that. But the the usability and the speed that that type of product enables you, I think, is just miles ahead of anything you can do locally. Well, great. Well, if I was going to to uh, to your you know to info web shift, I'd be I'd be very interested in all these topics. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for taking the time. I did go to InfoBib Shift last year, and I had a great time. So if you're thinking about going to a really good developer conference in a beautiful location, I would highly recommend InfoBib Shift. One of my good pals, Michael Cote, is going to be there. And so Michael's one of the great people of, uh, of uh, the cloud native world. And so that's just an example. And Ivan's one of the great people of, of this whole developer world. So... Thank you so much, Ivan, and we look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Thank you for having me, and I hope to see you later this year. You betcha. All right. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're on all the major social media platforms. You can always find us at thenewstack.io. We hope to see you soon.